All right, is this okay? I don't normally use a mic when I do intros here. Um, my name is Kathleen, I'm a librarian here at the Parma Snow Library. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to tonight's forum discussing marijuana legalization in Ohio, moderated tonight by Jackie Borchard. Uh, Jackie covers Ohio State government politics and more from Columbus for Cleveland.com. In early 2015, plans to legalize recreational marijuana through a consti constitutional amendment surfaced. Jackie, who had covered ballot issues in the past, took on the marijuana beat and continues to cover marijuana as an issue. Jackie holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Rochester and a master's degree from the um, from Missouri School of Journalism. She previously covered politics for the Dayton News, Dayton Daily News, and education for the Casper Star Tribune, Wyoming State newspaper. Um, I was asked to highlight two upcoming events. I think there were some handouts out there. One is regionalism at the West Shore Communities on Monday, November 14th at uh, Lakewood Public Library, as well as the relationship between Cleveland Police and the community Tuesday, November 15th um, at uh, Case Western Campus. And that form is here. So without any further ado, I'm gonna turn the floor over to Jackie. Thank you, thank you for that introduction. And do go check out the other events. This is part of a year-long series um, that the league has done with uh, Cleveland.com and some other partners. And uh, it, it's been really, I think, informative. And, and they're hosting them all around the region. So it's a great opportunity to get to other places you may not have been. 
Um, and we started planning this in the summer of 2015. Uh, we weren't 100% sure what we would be talking about tonight. Uh, recreational marijuana legalization measure was going to be on the November ballot, issue three. And uh, polling for recreational marijuana barely broke 50%, while support for medical marijuana reached an all-time high of 90% in favor. If issue three failed, odds were good that another well-funded effort would come into Ohio and focus on medical marijuana. And there was always the far less probable case that Ohio State Legislature, which had rejected marijuana reform bills for more than a decade, would act. As many of you know, a lot has happened in a year. And that most unlikely outcome of that scenario I just described has come true. Uh, a medical marijuana ballot measure backed by a national group uh, was headed toward the ballot, and legislators quickly started working on a bill. Uh, the Ohio General Assembly passed House Bill 523 in May with bipartisan support, and Governor John Kasich signed it into law. We'll talk a little more about the law and what's in store for the future, but first I'd like to introduce you to our panelists. And starting here to my left is Dr. Brian Batchelder. He is president of the Ohio State Medical Association. He is currently the Clinical Associate Director of Family Medicine at Akron General Hospital and a Clinical Assistant Professor in the College of Medicine and Public Health at The Ohio State University. Dr. Batchelder is an Ohio native, graduated from Dartmouth College, and earned his medical degree from the University of Cincinnati. Before joining Akron General, he ran a rural solo private practice for 25 years. Garrett Fortune is the founder and CEO of FunkSAC, a leading provider of compliant packaging solutions for the cannabis industry. Uh, including child-resistant packaging, odorless packaging, curing bags, and edibles packaging. Garrett attended Kent State University for business and graduated from the University of Arizona. He is a decorated U.S. Army veteran and is committed to manufacturing in the U.S. Tom Heron is an attorney with the law firm of Seeley Savage, Ebert, and Gurush, where he is a member of the firm's litigation, criminal defense, and regulated products practice groups. Tom was the 2014 Republican State Senate candidate for Ohio's 23rd District, and testified on House Bill 523 when it was before the Ohio Senate Government Oversight and Reform Committee earlier this year. Tom is a member of the National Cannabis Bar Association, National Cannabis Industry Association, and Normal Legal Committee. He also runs a marijuana law blog that you should check out after this. Um, and to his left is uh, Kelly Kafaver. She has been working in the legislature. She is here on behalf of Senator Kenny Yuko. Um, Senator Kenny Yuko uh, couldn't be with us tonight. Uh, he is a, a, a Democrat in the Ohio Senate that represents the 25th District. He's from Richmond Heights. Um, he, uh, he wanted to be here because he was the lead Democrat on, in the Senate who worked on House Bill 523, and it's been an issue that he's worked on since, uh, since he started in the legislature as a House member in, in 2005. Um, Prior to his time in the legislature, he was a uh, political and union activist for more than two decades. Uh, he grew up in Euclid and uh, resides in Richmond Heights with his wife, and he has two adult children. So Kelly is here. Uh, she is uh, Senator Yuko's senior legislative aide. She's been working in the legislature since December 2014, where she started as a Legislative Service, Services Commission fellow. She graduated from the University of Miami in 2010 with bachelor's degrees in journalism and political science. She's been working with Senator Yuko since December 2015. And also here uh, for, on Senator Yuko's behalf is Brianna Stabler. Uh, she has, uh, she is a legislative aide for Senator Yuko and has been working for the legislature since September 2014, uh, where she started as an administrative aide to Senator Eric Kearney. Uh, from, he was from Cincinnati. She graduated from the University of Phoenix with a bachelor's degree in business management and has been working with Senator Yuko since January 2015. Um, so we have some people here who have been following this issue very closely and is probably very personal for them. And we have others who have probably not been following it very closely. Um, my hope is that we can be respectful of all opinions on this and that everyone walks away from here learning something new. Um, the way that I'd like to keep this pretty informal, um, I've got a couple questions pre prepared for our panelists and I will um, direct them to one or more of our panelists uh, if, or some, some questions to the panel as a whole. And uh, to the panelists, if you want to jump in at any point or add to what something someone else has said, uh, you know, just just kind of nod and and we'll let you let you talk. I don't think this is going to be a repeat of the uh, debate we saw the other night. Um, That's what you think. I, I'm hoping not. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, and then we'll also have time to take questions from the audience. I think there's some pink uh, cards that are being passed around, and, and Mike has more in the back. So feel free to to ask questions, and we hope to have a uh, quite a bit of time actually for that portion. 
Okay. So Ohio is, was the 25th or 26th state to legalize medical marijuana, depending on uh, who is counting and what. Uh, and that's because every state has done so a little differently. Um, Ohio's law allows people with about 20 medical conditions to buy and use marijuana if recommended to them by an Ohio licensed physician. Uh, the law does not allow smoking marijuana or growing your own at home. The law took effect in September, but it will be a year or two before patients will be able to walk into a dispensary and, and buy a product. Uh, meanwhile, three le regulatory agencies will write the rules and regulations, including, uh, for example, how business licenses will be awarded and how patients will sign up for the program. This delay has caused a lot of frustration among patients who are hoping to take advantage of the program and people who want to start a business in the industry here. Um, so my first question is for, for Kelly and, and, and Brianna. Can you talk a little bit more about why the legislature took the path that they did? Uh, for example, you know, why leave many of the regulations to still be written instead of you know, including them in the legislation? So first, um, you know, we'd like to read just a little bit, a short statement from Senator Yuko, oh, sure. since he can't be here. Um, and then after Brianna does that, I'll be able to answer that question. Um, so Senator Yuko wanted to thank everyone for showing up today, and he's very sorry that he wasn't able to attend. He's very bummed about it, because he loves talking and advocating for medical marijuana. Um, he's in the middle of chemo and radiation very intensely, and does not have um, a voice <laughs> right now. Um, but he's been fighting for this for a very long time, even before he was a legislator. Um, and it was brought to his attention from a couple of constituents of his from the 25th district. Um, so and when he was at first addressed, um, he didn't think it was even possible or even an option. Um, I know he had to really read up on it and uh, do a lot of research on it. Um, and what he discovered was incredible. And from then it took off where he wanted to make it accessible to everyone who needed it. Um, so I think part of the reasoning why um, the legislature decided to go with a bill rather than let um, you know the course be run through a constitutional amendment um, was uh, because that a bill isn't set in stone. Um, so anything, any piece of legislation that is passed by the General Assembly is going to, if it becomes law, it uh, it goes into the o Ohio Revised Code. And something that Senator Yuko loves to say is they call it the Revised Code because you can revise it. Um, so, uh, you know, a lot of issues that uh, other states, uh, states that preceded Ohio, um, uh, have been seeing is that it, it's hard to make necessary changes and to react quickly to a market that's opening up in a space that that's completely new um, in, in in a space like Ohio uh, where there there was no uh, market beforehand other than the illicit market. Um, so uh, to be able to react to that, it means that. Um, we need to be able to have the flexibility to uh, be able to revise the law as we see things happening that aren't necessarily what were meant to happen or or need to react to changing market conditions or, or whatnot. Um, that doing a law instead of pursuing a constitutional amendment would allow, uh, allow that law to be flexible mm -hmm. um, and to be reactive to the needs of the market and uh, as sought fit by the General Assembly. Um, so I think that's a big, uh, a big reason why we didn't, why, why the legislature didn't just like let the constitutional amendment happen. Um, and I think there was definitely an appetite um, after uh, the November 2015 election. As we saw, issue three was defeated, but there were some issues with issue three, um, including the monopoly aspect and the recreational uh, uh, marijuana aspect that um, were likely factors in why it didn't pass, but why we saw so much um, polling and public support um, for a medical marijuana program that was rel well regulated in mm -hmm. Ohio. So, right, and uh, just there was a ballot initiative that was that was working to get on the ballot this year uh, that they announced earlier, and I think in February uh, officially, 
And um, after the legislature passed House Bill 523, they pulled back on their effort and, and said that they would not go forward this year. However, all the signatures that they collected are still good. Um, and they have said that they are going to maintain it's a um, marijuana policy project out of DC have said that they are going to maintain a presence in the state. And if the legislature does not come through with what they promised with the bill, they can always throw that uh, measure on the ballot. Um, and, and meanwhile, there are two years for the regulations to be written just to kind of lay out a timeline. Um, the bill requires uh, the Department of Commerce to set rules for cultivators, for the growers, by, uh, by May of next year. And the idea there was to get the growers going first so that there is product ready to be sold in stores when the stores are licensed. Uh, and then by next September, the rest of the pieces have to be in place. So com the Department of Commerce also has to come up with the rules for the processors, the people that are going to be making the products, that are going to be taking the marijuana and making patches and oils and tinctures and um, packaging it to be sold, and uh, retail stores and dispensaries, how they're going to be licensed, uh, the pharmacy board is going to decide that, the state board of pharmacy. And the state board of pharmacy is also going to be figuring out how patients will register for the database. Uh, and then the medical board will decide what uh, doctors will have to do to become certified to recommend marijuana um, and decide what kind of continuing education component doctors will will need to do. Um, so it, it's if it sounds like a lot of moving parts, that's uh, because it is. Um, and Garrett has, I, I think, got quite a bit of experience, you know, in working in other states, seeing how o Ohio has gone about setting up this three agency regulatory process. What, what could go right and what could go wrong here? Um, it's a complicated system with all those moving parts and all the different people trying to take priority and set rules. And it, you just have to make sure they communicate well. And what we see in other states, if there's one lead group, at least the communication, all the rules come through those very easily. If there's multiple groups that are, they have different initiatives. One might have money, one might have the medical aspect, and all those don't really intertwine when it comes to business. And so what happens, they change it a lot. It's a lot of modifications, and it costs money in the end. So what we see is, uh, a lot of the processors, the growers, the dispensaries are spending a lot more money than they planned on it because every time a rule change comes into effect, it affects everyone. For instance, uh, October 1, there was a new rule that got put into place in uh, Colorado as well as in Oregon where all the packaging changed. So all the edibles manufacturers have been making these candy bars and going forward and they're making good money and then they get told, well, with the change, not only is the packaging going to change, and you have to childproof every individual piece, but you have to stamp every little piece. And so that rule came out, which is a good rule, but it should have been thought of earlier, but it cost them a lot of money. So they had to throw all of that product out as well as all of uh, the packaging that they had gotten ready for and prepared, and there's nothing they can do about it. So it ended up costing the businesses a lot more money. Uh, and then when setting the rules, I think it's important that there's a lot of aspects that cross over that affect the other groups. So if you have a three-headed monster, you, you have to make sure that they all communicate and come together well. Not only the money aspect, but setting the rules and levels of uh, what is ac acceptable, uh, the extraction rules, and uh, being able to get things to market in the right time. So do you think Ohio is taking the right approach by by taking their time to, to kind of set these rules so that maybe there won't be so many changes down I the line? I have on that. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, the first view is there's a lot of patients out there that need to get medication. And from the medication side, it needs to be researched and explored more, which will keep going. But those first states, the pathfinders that have come out and been doing this for quite a while, those other 24 states uh, have a pretty established rule, and uh, they know the methodology pretty well. I think Colorado, if you spend more time with Colorado and some of the states that have established rules, you'll learn a lot. Uh, but at the same time, I know a lot of businesses that want to get going and get things rolling. So on that aspect, it's not as good. Uh, I think you need to actually sit down and spend a lot of time and make sure you have the what works, uh, take the lessons learned and the best practices that 
other states and countries have utilized and make sure it's done the right way. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned patients uh, needing to get their medicine as quickly as possible. And before the dispensaries open here, the law actually includes a portion that provides patients with an affirmative defense against uh, prosecution for certain uh, marijuana charges. And in order to use it, the patient has to have a note from their doctor essentially checking off some, some criteria saying they've had conversations, that they've looked up their, um, their, their record in the state uh, controlled substances database, for example. Um, and then you also would have to be following the law as to what types of marijuana you're using. Um, like you couldn't be be smoking it. Uh, that wouldn't you wouldn't be protected. It would have to be what would fall under the law. You'd have to have one of the, the medical conditions. Um, and the Ohio State Medical Association uh, told its members to hold off on on issuing these so-called affirmative defense letters uh, and ask for some guidance from the state medical board. And the medical board released a statement a few weeks ago that didn't it didn't really clear anything up. It it reiterated the language that doctors must be certified to make a marijuana recommendation, but in reference to the affirmative defense piece, uh, directed doctors to talk to their attorneys and employers. And, and so my question for you, Dr. Batchelder, is is the medical association pleased with this guidance, and and how is the association advising doctors to move forward now that we have it? Uh, essentially, they're advising doctors not to move forward at this time. Uh, it's very clear from the legislation that you cannot advise a patient to uh, use marijuana until you've gone through the certification process. And the certification process, those rules and regulations have not yet been developed. So until you have the certification process, you can't get um, the uh, you can't give that sort of advice. Uh, the state medical board's uh, letter essentially said if you advise before you are certified, be ready to get your own private lawyer. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, and part of that confusion, I think, comes from this word recommendation, because in the law, it is laid out that there is a, you know, an official recommendation, and then this affirmative defense piece. And, and I've talked with lawmakers that, um, you know, that worked on that part of the bill, and they said the intent of that was so that on day one, on September 8th, um, people would be able to, to go to their doctors, and elsewhere in the law, that became effective on September 8th. It, it provides some sort of immunity for physicians. Is, um, I know, Brianna, did you want to talk a little bit about that, or Kelly? Sure, Kelly. <laughs> a little better on that. Sure, <laughs> no worries. Um, so yeah, there is uh, the section, section six, I believe, of the un uncodified section of the law um, refers to the affirmative defense. And I think there is some confusion in the way that it's worded. The beautiful thing about the Legislative Service Commission, though, who is the agency that, nonpartisan agency that does all of the drafting for of all of the bills that have ever passed the General Assembly, um, is that one of the one of the rules in terms of drafting is um, that they can't they can't draft a catch twenty two, um, so to speak. So so in order to draft something that would be impossible, they, they, would, they wouldn't be able to do it. Um, so really, the way that, and, and what you see from the legislative intent, um, from comments from legislators such as my boss, Senator Yuko, and um, I know that Senator Burke had put out a statement back in, I want to say May or June, um, essentially saying roughly the same thing, that the way that this is to be read, the, the meaning of this is that uh, physicians um, would be able to, or, or that patients with qualifying conditions would be able to go to uh, their physician or a physician that is treating them for a, for a qualifying condition. Um, and that physician, uh, you know, so long as there is an expected standard of care, you know, to be held and all, all of the rest of the law would be, would be followed, um, that before any of the regulatory structure of um, the entire uh, bill uh, was actually put in place, that that was, that physician was meant to be able to issue a letter to the patient and that letter uh, would serve as an affirmative defense, which is basically, you know, saying, you know, you're get out of jail. You can't be convic convicted of a use or possession charge for marijuana, so long as you are using or possessing a form that would have been legal under the bill uh, or under the law once the law's uh, regulatory structure becomes in effect. 
Um, I hope that an answers the question. <laughs> yeah. But the catch-22 is that from a physician standpoint, you need that certification process before you're allowed to do it. So I really think that uh, if that's the full intent, in the lame duck session coming up, the legislature really needs to clarify that mm -hmm. for physicians. Uh, otherwise, I'm not going to risk my license, my livelihood, to be able to try to do what they're wanting us to do. So it really need, does need to be clarified. Sure, and totally understandable um, how, that, how that could be. While the intent is there, um, maybe the clarity of the entire law, it, it isn't necessarily clear enough to make physicians feel good about, you know, I have, I have a patient that, you know, I think would really, uh, you know, benefit from the use of med medical marijuana. Um, but, you know, do you want to risk your entire practice and also the future of that patient um, by, by allowing them to do that? So, you know, I, I totally understand your point, And, you know, maybe my boss can hook up with you. I'd <laughs> um, love to. Oh, great. <laughs> In addition to a, a lame duck fix, what would make it, what would make doctors more likely to recommend marijuana or even be comfort, more comfortable speaking with their patients about it? Well, the other, there's several other problems. Um, right now, from a federal uh, regulatory standpoint, it's a Schedule I uh, medication. And we have always said, in fact, we oppose the legislation because it didn't clarify that it really needs to move to a Schedule II. Schedule two really allows more of the um, uh, process for uh, doing research. And without the research, uh, doctors really need to have research, what's called evidence-based medicine, in order to be able to comfortably prescribe or recommend medications. Uh, and although there's a lot of um, information out there about how it may be helpful, there's very little really good evidence-based medicine. And that research really needs to happen because as a physician, the last thing I want to do is to recommend a treatment, which I'm not sure from an evidence-based medicine standpoint works. Mm -hmm. We've done many things like this in the past. Uh, I'll give a prime example, thalidomide. Now, you have to be fairly old to remember th thalidomide, but it was a medication given to women during pregnancy for nausea and vomiting. And we eventually figured out it made the babies sometimes miss fingers, toes, entire limbs. And we didn't know that until the research was really done. So we obviously don't want to make that same mistake again. Mm -hmm. there's, and another, there's another, here's one of those catch-22s again. If it goes to Schedule 2, which a lot of people are behind, there's no reason for a dispensary, and dispensaries would close. It would have to go through a pharmacy at that point. Yeah, and, I, and so that affects the business aspect as well as the money and all of that other, the other pieces. Yeah, right, I, the, the drug enforcement, I don't know if you want to talk about that, that they were, the DEA was looking at that issue this summer. Right, yeah, the DEA uh, examined this summer, and they really have been doing it for a number of years, and it kept being one of these things where the DEA said, okay, well, we're going to decide in about six months whether or not we want to reschedule marijuana, and then that time would come around, and they said, uh, well, I, okay, six months from now, we're going to tell you, and then... Six months. Okay, next six months we're going to tell you. And so they finally uh, issued a decision uh, this summer uh, deciding not to reschedule uh, marijuana to a different schedule. What they did is, is they just basically lifted the monopoly on research. So uh, it used to be that the University of Mississippi was the only uh, university that could grow research-grade uh, marijuana for research purposes. They've lifted that monopoly, so now that will open up the ability for additional research to be performed on, on marijuana. Um, but, I, you know, I think from the business standpoint, however it gets rescheduled, your typical market with dispensaries is not going to be in compliance with, with how this product is supposed to be distributed, whether it's Schedule 1, 2, 3, 4, whatever it is. Uh, from a business standpoint, and I don't know if, Garrett, you would agree, the only real solution is to deschedule marijuana and yeah. treat it like alcohol or, or tobacco, um, you know, that, that's primarily regulated, you know, like at the state level. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the rescheduling, I think for purposes of research and medicinal value would, would make some sense. It might also open up banking. It could assist uh, cannabis companies with... Uh, IRS 280E provisions, um, you know, it keeps them from taking kind of normal business deductions. But from the market as a whole, rescheduling really isn't 
you know, the magic bullet that I think people sometimes think that it is. All right, and just uh, to catch everyone up, uh, on the controlled substances list, Schedule One is considered most dangerous, no medicinal value, uh, it, heroin, LSD, marijuana, all in Schedule One, um, and 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 Tom touched on it. Uh, there there are are federal laws in place where Schedule One and Two drugs, if for tax purposes, you can't make business deductions. Um, banks, that's a that's a huge problem in in states is that the marijuana businesses are cash only because the banks don't want to touch the money. Um, even with some additional federal guidance that was supposed to clear that up, that didn't happen. Uh, so banks are mostly working with, with cash, and that raises all sorts of security concerns. Um, and I know Ohio is maybe trying to figure out a way to fix that by doing a closed-loop payment system. They're, they're, the Department of Commerce is looking at all sorts of different ways to try and uh, remedy that. But um, I do want to just talk briefly again about the, the medical research. And um, I, I want to ask you, Dr. Batchelder, to talk a little bit more about um, kind of the, the level of research that, that physicians require, because there, there is a lot of research out there. If you, you know, go on PubMed and you Google marijuana, there's uh, search marijuana. Um, you know, all sorts of studies pop up. Israel's done a lot of research. Um, I mean, what would need to happen, I guess, in the U.S. to to consider that, to meet that threshold that you talked about? Typically, the classic type of research is double-blind crossover studies in which you take a type of uh, a group of patients and you give them a placebo. You give a different type of patients the, or the same group of patients, actually, the same characteristics, a medication such as uh, marijuana, and then you see how it impacts whatever the disease is uh, that you're looking at. Then you take those patients off of them and you switch the groups just to be absolutely sure and see if you get the same results. Those types, and, and you also need numbers. And that's the other problem with some of the research that's been done. It's on small numbers. And because of the uh, lack of the strength of the studies, it's hard to, to generalize these studies to broad groups. So that's the type of research we're talking about. And that's the same type of research you use for your medications that you take every day for hypertension, diabetes, and those sorts of problems. Mm -hmm. um, and just, I guess, you know, to, that, is, that does seem to be the biggest criticism of medical marijuana, that, you know, that the research is, is absent. Um, but, but given that it's, um, I mean, what are some, I guess, what are some of the risks that, uh, that a patient might have for taking medical marijuana? Well, uh, and I have a hard time answering that question because, again, without the research, we don't know. Uh, we don't know what the, what the untoward effects are now. We sometimes see those sorts of things in emergency rooms, but, again, that's episodic. And you really shouldn't try to um, uh, broaden or generalize information from episodic information. It's just fraught with dangers. So, actually, I have a hard time answering that question because, again, the studies are lacking. Mm -hmm. I mean, would it be better if, if doctors weren't involved in this, in this program? It just seems, you know? Depends on who you ask. Yeah. <laughs> well, if any of you want to field that question, it was more of just... Um, if you're really talking about medical marijuana, then I think a doctor needs to be involved. Um, if you're talking about uh, liberalizing to general use, then get us out of the middle. Um, but again, you got to let us do the studies before we know what we're talking about. And that's one of the things also to remember about the legislation. This is voluntary by the physicians. Um, so just because you go to your doctor and say, hey, I want med medical marijuana for this problem, the doctor may say, well, I've not had the certification. They may choose not to get it just so they don't have to get in the middle of that. So I, abs I actually don't know how many physicians in a year or two are going to be willing to go out on, the, uh, um, uh, out on a limb and say, without the studies, yeah, maybe it's a good idea, maybe it's not. Again, we just don't know. Yeah, the, the state medical board did set out a survey to, to physicians across the state, and 15% um, said that they were highly likely to recommend marijuana to a patient with a qualifying condition. And then 36% had the complete opposite opinion that they were highly unlikely. Um, and the split was about 34% likely, you know, 45% unlikely. And when they were asked, you know, what would increase your likelihood of recommending, the most frequently chosen answer was peer-reviewed research indicated proven outcomes. 
Um, and so the law, though, it, it does provide uh, an avenue or several for research. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, so um, there, there is actually a provision in here, if I could find it in this tabbed mess here, um, about uh, physicians not needing necessarily to register um, in order to uh, participate in uh, research with a university. And also, um, there are laboratory testings also being done um, or intended to be done by universities in order to be sort of a quality control. So you, there is a, a great like research lab, research med lab um, aspect in here that you know we hope our big uh, medical research universities will be able to take advantage of and that the doctors at those universities will be able able to start, um, you know, doing those double blind and more accurate type and more large scale type um, studies um, in order to be able to provide that research um, for the greater medical community. Um, so there is an avenue in there for uh, research to be done without the physicians necessarily um, going through, uh, you know, a registration or sort of just, uh, the registration, I believe it is a specific mm -hmm. part of that process um, in order to do that research. So. Um, one aspect of Ohio's law that's been getting praise from reformers across the country is a provision that requires 15% of the marijuana business licenses uh, to go to minority business owners, uh, the rationale being that minorities who are disproportionately arrested for drug charges uh, are now being excluded from the legal industry in other states. Uh, and some lawmakers have already said that this may need to be changed in the lame duck session uh, the, the next coming months to make it more of a target instead of a requirement for, for constant to be constitutional, um, but still, uh, I mean, is this is this a fair proposal, Garrett? Um, well, I'm a veteran, so I qualify as a minority. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, <laughs> uh, I haven't I haven't seen this in too many other states. Uh, I know a lot of minorities in the industry, depending on where we go. Uh, there's a lot of people associated with it. I don't. I think it's going to be difficult to say there's a number. I I like the target idea rather than saying specific, it's going to be this number. Um, but me personally, it, it works okay because I'm a veteran, and that's considered a mini minority under this law. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there, it, it, the fact that it's a target rather than a requirement, um, you know, if not enough people apply and not enough of the minorities right. under the, the, the law apply, it doesn't mean that, like, nobody's going to get licenses. <laughs> um, it just means that, you know, that is, it's, it's more aspirational, I think, in, in that sense. So. Yeah, it, it's, it, there is a provision that says if, if you don't get that 15%, then they can go elsewhere. But um, And the, the law also, uh, along those lines, uh, allows former felons to participate in the industry. Um, what's the, the date back on that? Is that? How many years is it? I think it's five, but that's not one that I know off the top of my head, so Tom. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I think what, what the law says is the uh, Department of Commerce and the Board of Pharmacy have to make a determination for um, which convictions will outright bar you from getting a license and which convictions just have to be like more than five years old. Uh, so it sets up like a little bit of a tier. Um, I don't think we know yet really what those convictions are going to be. Mm -hmm. I think we could probably assume, you know, a sex offense is probably going to bar you. Probably something drug related is going to be a big problem. Um, but yet yeah, it sets up kind of two separate tiers uh, of criminal convictions that will impact people's ability uh, to get a license. And th those will be determined, you know, by rule, by commerce right. and pharmacy. Mm -hmm. Um, and I mean, why, why, I guess, were those pieces important to, to put into the law? That <laughs> so uh, not every aspect of this was I able to touch. So it, w it wasn't something that I worked on specifically. So it's hard for me to say exactly, because this was, you know, obviously a, a joint effort by a group effort by a lot of different legislators. Um, and, uh, but I believe the, the concern was there that um, that there would be an outright barring, like a general barring of felons from being able to participate in, in the medical mar marijuana control program at all, um, which, um, you know, 
given that uh, marijuana offenses, uh, you know, historically, uh, those convictions typically affect minorities um, greater than uh, than other demographic groups. Um, that that kind of works in conjunction with the the felony uh, part of it works sort of in conjunction with the part that we were talking about uh, a moment ago about um, including minority uh, a, a target of 15% minority licensures um, in order to make sure that you know some of these nonviolent uh, marijuana related offenses you know to try and right some of the wrong. Um, while it's not necess it's not uh, necessarily possible to you know give somebody back years of their life for a nonviolent you know drug offense or something like that, it, um, I think the idea was that uh, it would be wise to to not continue um, you know a a punitive a sort of effect with this particular uh, program. So, and I think it it also fits with what has been kind of a policy goal of the General Assembly as well as I think the governor. Um, to open up employment opportunities for people with prior criminal histories. I mean, we've seen them do a lot of really great things on sentencing reform, uh, you know, ban the box uh, type legislation, um, you know, opening up expungements and making them more avail available to people who, who have, you know, longer criminal histories uh, than uh, they were able to get previously. So I think it, it fits, uh, you know, along those same policy goals uh, that Columbus has had for you know, probably five or six years now, certainly since Governor Kasich, I think, has been in office. Um, so, you know, the elephant in the room, recreational marijuana. Um, you know, four states in the District of Columbia have legalized marijuana for just adult use. Another five states are going to vote on it this November. Uh, issue three went down almost two to one last year. Uh, is recreational marijuana in Ohio's future? Should it be? I want to ask the whole panel. Yeah. <laughs> So whoever wants to, what, start. <laughs> <laughs> what would so, Senator Yuko say? So, uh, so I actually have talked to Senator Yuko about this aspect, and uh, he's he doesn't believe in marijuana for recreational mm -hmm. use. Um, you know his personal belief um, on that, so that wasn't something that he was ever going to advocate for. If this, if the bill turned into a recreational bill, or if the. Uh, uh, constitutional amendment turned into a, a recreational amendment um, that wasn't going to be something that he was going to uh, to be able to support on personal grounds. Um, but uh, you know, sometimes minds change, and you know, he learned a lot about uh, medical marijuana. And in the very beginning, um, he hasn't uh, he hasn't decided to you know cross that bridge, and I I don't think that he will. Um, yeah, I think it is. Um, uh, you know, when I uh, was running for the state senate in 2014, um, I w was doing an interview with Mansfield Frazier, uh, with my primary opponent, and uh, Mansfield asked about medical marijuana and what was our stance on it. And at the time, I said, "Look, uh, I think there's a lot of potential." And I said, "I think it it should go through the legislature." Uh, and should not be a ballot initiative that we can't go back and change. And he kind of said, oh, well, you know, you, those Republicans down in Columbus are never going to do it. And I said, well, I don't know. I actually I think they will. Um, you know, I think if there's anything the General Assembly hates more than legal marijuana, it's ballot initiatives. <laughs> so I, I think come 2020, if we see polling similar to what we, what we saw this year with medical marijuana, I, th I think there's a real possibility that the legislature's going to pass a law uh, that would legalize recreational marijuana. I don't think Ohio will be the first one to do that. Uh, I think it'll probably happen in, in maybe a more conservative state or, or maybe a more liberal state uh, somewhere in the Northeast that, uh, you know, again, doesn't have as easy of a ballot initiative process or they have a state legislature that's, you know, equally as adverse as, as the General Assembly is. Um, but I, I think at a certain point, they're going to have to, you know, they're going to be staring down a ballot initiative that's polling at 75 percent. And they're going to have to make a choice. Do we want it to be something that's written in stone in the, in the state constitution? Or, or do we want something where we can take, you know, an existing system, uh, existing regulations, and modify it and be able to change it, uh, you know, as it, as it goes forward? Um, 
but I, I would not be surprised at all if, uh, if come 2020, we were in exactly the same place we were, you know, this past May uh, with House Bill 523. Just to sort of piggyback back off of what Tom just said, I, you know, I think there is a bias in the legislature toward, you know, making things in, into law instead of uh, yeah. constitutional amendments. You know, they, they like to do things first. Right. <laughs> um, so, you know, like I said, it's their job. The casino uh, amendment uh, might have had uh, something right, to do right. with that. <laughs> they did, yeah, they did get beat by that. Um, but uh, but I, I don't know... I think it's going to be hard to predict at what point the stomach for uh, or the appetite for rather in, in the public uh, recreational marijuana is going to exceed enough the stomach oh, for sure. being sure. able to mm -hmm. being able to pass a, a recreational marijuana through the legislature um, because there isn't necessarily like a, an evenness there as we saw from the vote sure. split in yeah, HB five twenty three. Absolutely, we should you know, have had 90% approval of that yeah, bill. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, but uh, uh, so I, I don't know that, that that equity is going to be in our near enough future for it to go through the legislature. That's fair. And no other state has done recreational marijuana through the legislature. They've all been ballot initiatives. And even on the medical side, most of them have been ballot initiatives. And you're now, you know, starting to see them through the legislature. And made a good point. I mean, it was polling at 90% and the vote was still uh, 17 to 15, I think. 18 in the, to 15, 18 to 15, 15, 15 yeah, in the Senate. Yeah, mm -hmm. so two votes decided decided it in the end. Garrett, what do you, what do you think? Sorry. Um, I got on, into this industry because of the medical aspect and my brother, but now that I've seen the recreational side develop on many other states and it's starting to get a lot more robust. I think the medical aspect first and then you learn what you're doing and then write the rules for the uh, recreational. For example, California right now, they're expecting $1 billion in tax revenue a year from recreational and that's going to change a lot of lawmakers decisions and finance committees <coughs> decisions if they're making a billion dollars in tax revenue that's <laughs> going back to the schools, the police and education. Uh, I think it's going to roll out eventually on the recreational side. I like the fact that they're going medical first, and then you learn what you're doing and establish the industry, establish the rules, and then you look at it. Are you taking questions? Yeah, I, I'm going to take questions after this. This is my last question. Thanks. Uh, from a medical standpoint, um, I think it's fair to say uh, that medical physicians tend to be fairly conservative. And the Ellis Mays position is opposing recreational. Uh, that being said, I do know of physicians out there who are um, uh, not opposed to it being recreational. Uh, and for many of the factors being uh, suggested, it, uh, there's financial considerations, a lot of other things to think about. Um, but within that framework, there are two other problems that we need to make sure we are thinking about. Uh, and even with medical marijuana, this is true is uh, how do you define uh, under the influence uh, when you're driving? Uh, it's not like alcohol where you can say a certain blood level, you're under the influence. It varies much more for individual. And the other thing is that uh, this does not prevent your employers from letting you go if you're caught under the influence at work. Uh, there is no protection under law from that. So you have to understand that even though it's legal to use, you cannot be under the influence either driving or potentially at work. Yeah, that, the employer aspect, I think you guys would agree, was kind of a, a deal killer uh, if, if there was going to be protections to patients to, you know, show up to work having used medical marijuana or to uh, take away the ability of employers to maintain drug-free workplaces. Um, that was a big deal for, I mean, a lot of Republicans down in Columbus. You know, I, I think you guys would agree. Yeah, I know that, you know, especially when we were looking at that aspect of, of the bill, um, that um, many of Senator Yuko's colleagues, um, that was sort of a, a le left a bad taste in the mouth of, <clears throat> of many Democrats, but I know that not having it in would have left a bad taste in the mouth of many Republicans. So that was one of those places where, um, you know, what what does it mean for do, is that worth killing the entire mm -hmm. you know program and, and you know obviously Senator Yuko was for medical marijuana and voted for the bill um, and to him um, and 
although not to others, um, you know, it's, it wasn't worth killing the entire program um, to, uh, to make it so that there weren't, wasn't going to be, you know, a medical marijuana program for the patients who really need it. Um, and yes, there are people who really need it that are going to have to weigh their options with their employers and have a lot of really hard conversations. And it's not something that, you know, uh, the Democrats who voted for the bill, including Senator Yuko, were real happy about being in the bill. Um, but it, it was that or no bill. And I, you know, if that's the choice, then we'd rather a program, have a program at all than, than not. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I think we're going to start taking some questions. Do you want to have them give you the cards? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, we've we've got a couple already. Um, <laughs> Uh, so since marijuana is still illegal under federal law, what are the, the risks for federal prosecution? Um, yeah, I can talk a little bit about that. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> um, the uh, Department of Justice is basically taking a hands-off approach to uh, states with legal marijuana programs that meet uh, various federal enforcement priorities. And that's from a uh, memorandum that came down from uh, Deputy Attorney General James Cole uh, back in 2013. Uh, you know, there was some guidance before that from the Department of Justice, but it was, uh, it, it, it didn't really work. Um, so uh, the federal government is not getting involved in legal states where, you know, the states have a, a robust regulatory system, where they're preventing diversion uh, from a legal state into other states where the money's not, you know, going to cartels, where there's no risk of, you know, these dispensaries being run by armed gangs and things like that. So uh, as it stands now, at least until uh, President Obama leaves office and we get a new attorney general uh, in January, uh, the federal government is, is not getting involved in state uh, marijuana in, in uh, legal states where people are compliant with those state laws. Now, the the thing about you know that is that can all change. Um, it can change if there's a new attorney general appointed who issues a different policy, maybe rescinds the coal memorandum. Um, <coughs> you know, if if Donald Trump wins and Chris Christie is a, is appointed the attorney general, he was he was the only presidential candidate that uh, was opposed to state legal marijuana programs. I think he said during one of his town halls, you know, uh, smoke up now because if I get in, into office, you know, he, he wanted to send DEA agents into legal states, which would be his prerogative. Uh, and it, it would be the attorney general's prerogative to do that if he or she wanted to. Um, Donald Trump himself has said that he was in favor of, of medical marijuana. He would not be in favor of recreational marijuana. And Hillary Clinton has given some signals that, you know, she would instruct the DEA to reschedule marijuana to Schedule Two to open it up for research and, and would continue kind of the hands-off approach to uh, legal states where people are operating in, in compliance with those state laws. So, um, you know, the hands-off approach won't change uh, unless we get a new attorney general or unless we see legislation from Congress. There's been some, there have been a couple of bills that have been introduced. Um, there's like the Carers Act, which was introduced by Rand Paul and Cory Booker, I think. I, I think. Gillibrand yeah. Yep. Um, that would basically codify a lot of that, the Cole Memorandum, and, and, and say that if you're in compliance with the state's laws, that the, the DOJ isn't going to come in and prosecute you. It would open up banking uh, by way of statute. Uh, to allow and give banks the cover to bank in the cannabis industry. There's also an access to banking, medical marijuana access to banking act or something that has been introduced right, uh, in the Congress. It, it's super narrow. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, we need legislation out of Congress to really fix the problem because otherwise these policies can change uh, from administration to administration and can, in, in theory, change within an administration uh, with a new attorney general. So. Yeah, I've got a question about um, the qualifying medical conditions. I'm just going to read them real quick uh, 
so we all know what they are. Uh, AIDS, uh, ALS, Alzheimer's disease, cancer, uh, CTE, Crohn's disease, epilepsy, or another seizure, seizure disorder, uh, fibromyalgia, glaucoma, hepatitis C, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, multiple sclerosis, pain that is either chronic uh, and severe or intractable, Parkinson's disease, uh, HIV, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, sickle cell anemia, spinal cord disease or injury, Tourette syndrome, traumatic brain injury, and colitis. If there's limited research, how were the qualifying conditions determined, and how will conditions be added? <laughs> so, um, That's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> I know we're all probably wondering. <laughs> um, the, so... <laughs> I can do it. You want to do it? Yeah, I can do it. So um, in the bill, uh, we made sure that those who had qualified conditions that weren't on the list, they are able to, uh, shoot, what's the word? They can petition. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, petition conference in the pharmacy to get their qualifying condition on the list. So that's a that's a way that those can change. Also by statute, they can change. You know, if they uh, if the if there's an appetite in the general assembly to change it in statute, they can pass a bill um, or a, a writer on another bill um, in order to add or remove qualifying conditions. Mm -hmm. um, but I believe uh, what was looked at initially were a, 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 there are several studies, while they might not be double-blind and, you know, as airtight as we want them to be, there are a lot of studies out there that show um, some of the effects of uh, medical marijuana on certain conditions or, or actually um, not necessarily even conditions, but uh, really uh, symptoms of conditions or symptoms of treatment of conditions. So, uh, you know, you see pain on there. Pain is... Uh, can be a disease, but it can be uh, a symptom of other diseases that may not be listed there. You also see things on there like um, IBD and ulcerative colitis um, because of uh, medical marijuana's ability to stimulate the appetite, for example, and, um, and aid in digestion. So um, there, there are items on there that are on there because of the common, most common symptoms um, that are caused by those diseases. Um, and of course, you know, like Brianna uh, mentioned, there's a way uh, for folks to be able to petition mm -hmm. um, the medical board, I believe, uh, to, to be able to add. Um, uh, yeah. a qualifying condition. Yeah. Great. Um, multiple studies show that cannabis is not the gateway drug. Uh, rather, children have more access to tobacco and alcohol within their households. What gives the General Assembly the right to infringe on our ability to grow our own medicine at home? So why, I guess, why did the why legislature exclude uh, home grow? Home grow. Um, there were concerns uh, among senators that I heard during the process, there were concerns uh, that we heard during committee um, from senators concerned about particularly the the safety, the safety and the potential for diversion um, in a home grow program. I know that uh, you know there are differing opinions out there, and there are differing opinions among those in the General Assembly. But I believe that in order to pass, the, this was another one of those points where some people felt very strongly one way and some people felt very strongly another way. Um, uh, but that in order to, uh, at the end of the day, in order to have a program at all, it was one of those sticking points that it, it did stay out. Um, so it was not legalized for home production. Um, now, that could always change in the future. <laughs> That's why it's in the revised code. <laughs> so we're hopeful that if studies show that it, and we can get more senators to pass such a legislation or add to it, hopefully maybe one day people can have homegrown. But again, from a medical standpoint, one thing we stress is that it takes a certain amount of medication to have an effect in the body in order to be able to control a problem. Well, if you're growing it at home, it depends on the amount of fertilizer, the amount of water. Uh, the, it can vary greatly in the concentration of what a homegrown product is, where by this type of process, you can actually monitor and make sure that uh, the uh, marijuana distributed falls within a uh, rather narrow uh, amount of the medication that's being given. 
So you have much more of a control over the effect and whether it's going to work for the person or not. Well, not only overdose, but uh, if you don't take enough, it doesn't work for the problem. So it works both ways. Um, there's a couple of questions about the affirmative defense piece, just that, you know, it's, someone says they've t spoken to multiple attorneys uh, who, can't, who can't understand it. Um, and uh, that, you know, the medical board, uh, I guess, would you, con Dr. Bachelor, would, you, would the OSMA consider suggesting the medical board draft some sort of rule, emergency rule in the, in the interim? Well, the medical board can only uh, develop rules and regulations within the law that's been passed. And if there's conflict within that law, they're not the organization that needs to decide what that conflict, how it's uh, um, uh, resolved. So that's back to the legislative process to be able to resolve a conflict. Actually, that was my question. Um, I'm Dave Patton. I'm with the uh, Ohio Patient Network. I'm also uh, their legal counsel. Under the Administrative Procedures Act, the medical board, like all other agencies, has the power to promulgate emergency rules. Okay, so you mentioned that there was a, uh, a catch-22, and you mentioned maybe the lame duck uh, session might resolve it. Mm -hmm. um, there's another solution. The medical board itself, if they wanted to, they could do it today. They could promulgate an emergency rule under Revised Code Chapter 119 that would resolve this catch-22. And they could do so to honor the legislative intent of House Bill 523. So the question is, oh, and, you know, for what it's worth, I'm also a lobbyist. I drafted such a rule, but the medical board won't give me the time of day. So might uh, the medical association uh, prevail upon the medical board to fix it themselves? So you, you, don't, you don't have to go to the legislature. The agency can do it. Um. We have some influence, but we can't tell them what to do. So, uh, but if, uh, you know, again, if you'd want to give that information to the OSMA, we'd be happy to take a look at it and, and see what can be done. Because certainly we don't want to place uh, doctors and patients in a quandary. Uh, if that's what the intent of the law was and the board can take care of it, great. Just, just a reminder, Dr. Batchelder is not on the medical board. He's I'm not on the, he's not on the medical I'm not board. not a lawyer either. So, <laughs> um, so I, again, along the lines of the affirmative defense uh, that allows patients to, to possess some marijuana without going to jail, where can they get their medical marijuana from? Out of state? By mail? I would not get it by mail. <laughs> <laughs> we had a story about yeah, that. Uh, I think that's a bad idea. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's a that's bad. Um, you know, so uh, you know, this uh, the, the affirmative defense um, is is well intentioned. Uh, I'm also one of those lawyers that has trouble making heads or tails of how in the heck it's supposed to work. Um, not only with the concerns raised by a lot of people about whether doctors are able to recommend medical marijuana to, to patients now without being certified. Um, you know, uh, I, it's not clear. Uh, I, I don't think it's as, as clear that they're certainly not allowed to do it, and it certainly is not clear that they are allowed to do it. Um, but, you know, we, we talked about federal enforcement priorities that keeps the feds out of our hair. And one of those federal enforcement priorities was to prevent diversion of marijuana into other states. So right now, there's, we don't have any dispensaries here in Ohio. So patients' options are either the illicit market or to go to a different state and purchase medical marijuana there and then bring it back to Ohio, which directly implicates one of those federal enforcement priorities that the feds have outright told us, don't do this, and then we'll stay out of your hair. Um, then there's the practical issue of which states do you go to to get it? Because if you want to go to Michigan, you got to be a Michigan resident to get a card to purchase from a Michigan dispensary. Um, if you get that card, I don't think you need to be a resident in Michigan to, to work at the, or to uh, make a purchase from the dispensary, but you got to get the card in the first place. Um, so that pr presents an enormous problem for Ohio patients because Pennsylvania doesn't have an operating market yet. Indiana doesn't have an operating market. Kentucky doesn't have an operating market. So you're really talking about heading west, uh, at least as far as Illinois, uh, 
to get medical marijuana in a form that would be somewhat controlled, somewhat um, standardized. You know, it, it's easy to grow pot. Knuckleheads have been growing pot for forever, but to grow medical grade marijuana, it's actually really difficult um, because there are a lot of variables that you have to control, and that doesn't really happen in the illicit market. Um, so uh, the answer is you, you got to go to either your your corner dealer, um, or you have to go out of state uh, if you if you want to get it, uh, which is a, a big but big you can't problem. Bring it back. But you're not supposed to bring it exactly, uh, and um, you know uh, it's it's a it's a big it's a big 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 issue. And the, so, I mean, it's a risk all around. Sure. Yeah. Well, the other thing is even the states with reciprocal rights like Nevada. You have to have a written do from your doctor, and you can't get it here in Ohio. So your doctor's not going to give you a recommendation. You're not going to get a card. They're not going to allow you to yeah. buy it in those other states. Yeah. Um, let's see. Let's do. Uh, so part of the, the the medical board will come up with how doctors are certified to, to recommend, and then an education component. Um, I get, this question is for Dr. Batchelder. Do you foresee the, the medical community studying the endocannabinoid uh, system as part of this or even beyond the, the scope of the certification process? Well, yes, that's absolutely where the res research is going. Uh, it's the cannab cannab <laughs> cannabinoids, there we go, <laughs> cannabinoids that are the active ingredient. Um, and it's funny how one uh, different type of cannabinoid will be very active in the body and another one will not have no, absolutely no effect. There's also certain cannabinoids that will affect certain parts of the body and have no effect on other parts. But again, that's where the research needs to go. It'd be nice to tailor these medications to specifically what you want to hit rather than hitting all across the whole body. And that's what we try to do as physicians is narrow the range of the therapeutic effect so that we can get specifically what we want. Mm -hmm. um, here's a question. What are other countries doing about marijuana issues? What can we learn, if anything, about how, how they've handled issues uh, about recreational marijuana also? Well, we, uh, we have a distributor that handles eight countries in Europe and then uh, Canada as well. Canada does it in the mail system, which is kind of funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's different rules. Uh, we're seeing a lot of people from other countries, Austria, Germany, uh, Amsterdam, or Holland, uh, going to study in Colorado and Oregon, and they're spending time there with the, the legal side as well as the medical side and the recreational for rules making. <laughs> and uh, I mean, the, the home of marijuana and the, the most research has been done in Israel. And a lot of people go there from Europe as well. And then we're starting to see South and Latin America come on board with rules, and we're seeing them in the states uh, spending time with the Nevada, with Oregon, with Colorado, and uh, spending time here to see what we're doing with our rules. So is there any, any country that is more, you mentioned Israel. I mean, are there other, other countries that maybe Ohio can, can look to throughout this process? Um, Yes. I mean, Canada's got a pretty good system, but even though they go through the mail. Uh, they've done a lot of research. There's a lot of successful companies up there. They've written some great rules that keep progressing. Uh, they're, I think Israel's good. Germany has a very robust system as well, and it keeps progressing all the time. I think those are the key points where we have states that go to those places that we're getting a lot of information from. Mm-hmm. Um, is, is there a difference between medical and, and recreational marijuana? Yes. For anyone. <laughs> and what is it? Yes. Well, and I, I think I addressed this earlier. It depends on the conditions in which the medical marijuana is grown um, and recreational marijuana, which it's grown. So um, it can vary according to different plant types. Um, uh, yeah, there's a lot of variation. But I, I will tell you that I go to a lot of grows and they, the seed to sale system monitors a plant from beginning to end, whether it's medical or recreational on the tax purposes, as well as how that's being cared for, the management on the chemicals that are being put into it. Uh, there's, no, there's not so much on the strain, but you will see a lot of the same medical flower on the medical side, because when you go into a dispensary in Colorado, there's, if it's medical, 
you'll have the medical side and then you'll have a recreational side and they're separated. They have different products. The flower itself, we call pot flower in the industry. The flower itself is grown in the same environment, same thing. Uh, the edibles and the extracts and the processors are all done a different way. That's how they dose it. That's how they measure all the consistency. But it's all tested the same. It's all goes to a lab for THC content. I, don't, I think there's some states uh, that are looking at if a THC content is over a threshold of like 22%, they may uh, only allow that for medical, but there's still research in that. It is separated though physically in the grow and how they go about growing everything and cultivating it and uh, testing it all goes to a lab. Uh, what have we learned already from Colorado? Um, from the business side, we've had a lot of rules that have changed from the beginning and the end. Uh, we've seen different statistics on the crime rates. We've seen uh, drug use and kids go down, actually. Um, we've seen uh, a lot of tax dollars. I mean, if you ever go to Denver, you'll see the tax dollars, and the schools are getting a lot. There's a new rail system. The city uh, just got rated the top city in the country, I think. There's a lot going on in Colorado. There's also a lot of research going on. Uh, the schools out there are researching it. The companies are putting back into the community and paying for additional research. Uh, you don't see a lot of marketing, which is good. It doesn't need to be marketed very well. Uh, there's been a lot of consolidation in the industry. We've seen that when it comes out, for instance, uh, cannabis was like $3,400 a pound at wholesale, and now it's gone down to about 1400 in Colorado. So you see a lot of converge, a lot of uh, businesses consolidating. You've seen a lot of businesses go away. Uh, the black market is always an issue, whether it's uh, legal or not. But I think the black market numbers have dropped in Colorado uh, and Washington. Uh, from a medical standpoint, there's some growing concern, though, that use among the younger population, teenagers and down to that group, may be causing some uh, loss of mental capabilities. Um, it may, and, but the problem is we don't know how much, and again, that research is just really starting. Um, so I think there is some, some real concern among younger users um, as far as uh, potential problems. And um, what, what are Ohio's hospitals uh, doing in reaction to the new medical marijuana law? So, so we've heard of some hospital systems being open to the idea. We've heard of some hospital systems not being necessarily as open to the idea of their, of the the physicians that uh, work at them, um, <laughs> uh, recommending mar marijuana to their patients necessarily under their roofs. Um, so, uh, you know, I think I think you're going to see a mixed bag, and I think uh, part of the reaction to that mixed bag is going to be also like whether that is a, a university hospital, uh, like a medical research facility, um, you know, that where we hope to see more uh, physicians taking advantage of their uh, ability to not have to necessarily register in order to see how this is going to react uh, react in their patients, um, you know, especially patients with uh, se severe symptoms or severe uh, diseases and things like that. So um, I think I think reaction, at least as far as we've heard in, in the office, has been mixed. Mm -hmm. um, okay, here's a question about vaporizers. Um, first, I've got a couple questions, actually. First, um, why why is why is vaporizing marijuana allowed and smoking is not when smoking is the preferred method for many marijuana users? And then follow up uh, another question: How will the expanded oversight of the FDA regarding vaporizers and e-cigarettes affect uh, the new law's implementation? So. So I think we can kind of trade on this. Um, oh, there was a lot of uh, talk, especially in committee. Um, again, we heard a lot of testimony, and um, I believe OSMA uh, may have tested, uh, tes testified on this uh, fact, either in the House or in the Senate. I don't know, it was kind of a blur. Um, <laughs> so, so many testimonies and so many long days. Um, but I know that there was concern from uh, many medical professionals that uh, smoking had also potentially harmful 
effects um, because of the combustion aspect. You're inhaling, you know, actually combusting material. And I think that was, you're probably going to say it way more eloquently than I am. <laughs> oh, that's pretty much it. Okay. <laughs> uh, no, it, and it's not only the combustion aspect, but you're also talking about other chemicals that are produced during the smoking and during vapor you're obviously just inhaling probably what is we're hoping will be the active ingredient. So you're going to narrow down the amount of materials that are entering the lungs. All right. I've got a couple of questions about cultivators. Um, one asks where you can get a cultivation license today. Um, and you can't. They're not going to... Well, yeah, we won't know. In, <laughs> we won't know. In, <laughs> excuse me. We won't know until sometime next year. Um, they haven't even decided how many licenses they're going to give out. Um, so what, I guess, uh, what do you guys envision the cultivating license, the license process to be like in Ohio? Oh, by the way, if that was from a physician, you're never allowed to have one, so. <laughs> uh, sure, I mean, I don't, we don't know yet. I mean, we, we can have no idea because the rules haven't been written yet. Um, I don't know if, if you guys have heard anything on the rulemaking process. You know what you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh, and I was, I was actually just talking with somebody today, uh, and there are a lot of people walking around and say, well, you know, from what I'm hearing, and, well, you know, the people that I'm talking to are saying there's going to be five licenses, or, well, I heard today, you know, somebody told me there's going to be 170 licenses, or it's going to be 30 licenses. I mean, we, we don't know yet. Um, so uh, it's going to be, and Garrett, you can probably talk to this better than I can, but it's, it's going to be an expensive process to get a license. It's going to be an arduous process to get a license. There's going to be significant barriers to entry. Um, you know, it's not going to be easy. It's probably going to be competitive in nature. There's going to be a set amount, and there's going to be more applicants than there are licenses. Uh, so there's going to be a real risk of investing you know, hundred, two hundred thousand dollars in the application process, and then not getting a license, especially at, at the cultivation level. Um, so I, you can probably yeah, it's very, it's a very expensive process. Everyone thinks when it comes legal, oh, I can open up a warehouse and go. Uh, we've seen a lot of companies that have put in, and what we see is groups. It's usually not just one individual that says I'm going to go be a cultivator. We see a group of investors come together. They form an LLC. Uh, they run it as a company. They bring a consultant in from one of the other states that has already done this in multiple states and written applications. They file their paperwork. It goes through all the testing and everything. And at the end of the day, you might have spent a half a million dollars on the application process and you got nothing. It all also depends on who you have on that license, what individuals are there, what their experience is. If you partner with somebody that's done this before and has gone through the process, it's a lot easier, I think, at w w what we're seeing in other states. Um, but it is a lot more expensive than everyone thinks. Whatever you think you're going to need to spend, double it. And it's not just that. It's the security. It's, it's running things. Uh, you'll see your margins diminish as more people come in. Uh, you'll see you have to have more security, more lawyers. Which like is a that. good thing. <laughs> <laughs> the legal That's aspect of it, the accounting aspect of it, the banking aspect of it. There's a lot of moving parts in there that you need to understand, and it costs money. I think one of the things that, you know, Senator Yuko hopes to see, and I know that many patient advocates hope to see, is that the costs are kept, at least from, from the standpoint of, uh, you know, what is actually going to be charged by the Depart Department of Commerce to uh, people who are applying for a cultivator license. I know that one of the things that we're crossing our fingers for and hoping for is that costs will be kept. Um, as low as is necessary in order to, you know, create a feasible system because the system is going to require money to continue to run. Um, and there was, a, you know, a, an ask for some money to start up this, you know, kickstart the system in order for commerce and pharmacy to hire the necessary staff to start writing these rules that we hope to see um, by uh uh, I believe May 8th, I think, is the is the time, time frame yeah. for the cultivator license uh, license or licensure rules to come out. Um, but uh, you know, I, I think we hope that costs will be kept down in order to keep costs low for patients. We hope that there will be consideration for how big um, how big the market is going to be in Ohio in terms of how many patients are are going to be 
uh, needing product so that there is enough product to go around, again, to keep costs low for patients. Um, and it, because we know uh, that costs are a huge issue and a lot of times uh, medical marijuana for some people is an option that is going to be in the long run less expensive than uh, other pain management uh, medications and other, and other uh, medications as well. Um, so I think keeping costs low and making sure uh, that, that uh, you know, medical marijuana a lot of times is going to be in the long run less expensive um, as a medication for pain management and potentially other treating other symptoms and other diseases as well, which we hope to see more research on. Um, but that you know, hopefully those rules all down the line for all of the licensures will be will keep those costs low and keep supply um, abundant um, in order to make sure that uh, p the people who need this, the patients, are going to be able to get a, a product that's not too costly. Along those lines, I have a question asking, uh, will my insurance cover medical marijuana? Not right now. Um, not as long as it's, it's federally prohibited um, because it can't be prescribed. You know, these are recommendations. From a physician standpoint, I think the office visit may be covered because you're seeing them for a condition. And what your recommendation is for that condition may vary across a broad spectrum of different treatments. It may include marijuana, but once you get outside the office, I would agree that it, your insurance, you're talking a cash-only basis for more than likely. All right. I think um, we're running out of time here. I want to give each of our panelists just a, a couple minutes to give some closing thoughts um, before we wrap up here, and, and uh, you know, thank you again for, for coming tonight. So. Great. Um. <laughs> With that last point I made, that was actually the last thing I had on my list. So <laughs> uh, I pretty much made all my points. But uh, I guess the one thing I'll, I'll reiterate is that this is a voluntary program. Don't go to your physician expecting to have them had the certification. Or even once the certification is done, that they will have done it or make the recommendation. So if you're really thinking you want medical marijuana for one of the 20 conditions, you might want to call your physician and say, do you uh, recommend marijuana as a treatment for the 20 conditions? And if they say, no, we're not part of that program, then you want, might want to be looking elsewhere. So it's voluntary. Remember that from a physician standpoint. Um, from the business aspect of it, I say uh, make sure you have a good team and plan a good business plan and you look into this and look at the other states that are out there. Maybe use some consultants on building that. It's a lot different. Everyone thinks, oh, the green rush, you're going to make a billion dollars. <laughs> it's a lot of work. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts, a lot of changes. The laws change all the time. The rules change all the time. Uh, and it depends. Every state's different. So I would imagine Ohio will have a lot of different changes. Look at some of the other states that exist and how businesses are operating correctly and what you're looking for specifically, as well as just make sure you have a good operations team around you. Um, to make sure that you follow through it because there's a lot of rules and a lot of laws and the state will put their finger on everything. The IRS puts their finger on everything um, and the rules enforcement group will be keeping a watch on everything. So mm -hmm. I would say just be prepared. It's a lot more expensive than you think. Um, well, first, I want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, I want to make sure I thank Michael and Jackie, the League of Women Voters, uh, Case Western Reserve for putting this on. Um, you know, and definitely I want to thank Senator Yuko and his staff. Um, when I was in law school, uh, I was one of the editors of the Journal of Law and Health at Cleveland Marshall, and I put together a symposium on legalizing medical marijuana. We brought in some people from uh, a lawyer from Michigan and some other people from Ohio, and Senator Yuko was one of our speakers. Um, and that was, you know, five years ago when he was introducing bills that nobody would pay any attention to. Um, <laughs> so he's been, I know, really fighting hard for this for a number of years. Uh, and believe me, coming from a Republican, that is not faint praise. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, I mean, he deserves a ton, a ton of credit uh, bringing Senator David Burke along, who's one of the most conservative members of the Ohio Senate, uh, to support this bill is a, an enormous feat. Um, you know, it's not perfect. Uh, it certainly is not what, you know, it's one of these bills where there, 
you got people on both sides that hate it uh, for totally different reasons, but it, that probably means at the end of the day you have a decent bill. Um, <laughs> it's, it's definitely better than what we've had. Uh, this is going to make an enormous difference for people uh, here in the state. Um, you know, uh, it, it, it gives patients and their physicians another choice in their health care decisions to make. Um, it's voluntary, uh, to Dr. Batchelder's point, um, but it, it gives another option to patients who, you know, really haven't had that option before. So, um, you know, I, I think be careful uh, if, if you want to get a recommendation now from a physician. I know there are doctors that are writing recommendations, um, and I don't know that that's a doctor I would necessarily want to go to. Um, because it's, you know, if they're playing fast and loose now, who knows what else they're playing fast and loose with, um, even though, like I said, it's not totally clear that they'd be prohibited from writing that recommendation. But be careful if you're a patient. Be careful if you want to get into this industry on the business side. Um, be careful if you're an employer. Be careful if you're an employee and you want to use medical marijuana. Um, there are a lot of pitfalls. So, um, but again, thank you, everybody, for, for coming out, for putting on this event, and for letting me be a part of it. Um, one of the things that we have noticed, um, though, just to point out there at the end, um, local governments have also been passing bans for communities not to um, have the medical marijuana business happening. Um, our perspective is really trying to make sure you guys go out there and advocate to your local officials to kind of have them wait till rules come out. So really get out there and make sure you're talking to your local officials. Um, is one of the things that Kenny has also been uh, really trying to get out there. Um, and another thing he wants us to make sure um, he likes to quote um, <laughs> is if we can um, give one veteran comfort, ease one patient's horrible pain, prevent one heroin overdose, or save one child's life, this bill was worth it. And I know that uh, I, I think, you know, those words are, are great <laughs> words. <laughs> that was a, a quote from uh, Senator Yuko's uh, floor speech, I know. And then I think Tom pretty much stole pretty much else, uh, everything yeah. else that yeah. I was going to say. Um, but, you know, I, the other thing that I'd like to point out was this was a great bipartisan effort, um, you know, without the help of David Burke and uh, without the uh, many hours that his staff um, also put into uh, you know, going around the state and, and trying to uh, find out what we need and what is palatable to the public and, and take that back to the General Assembly and say what is going to be palatable to, to these lawmakers, um, that, that there was a huge bipartisan effort and that the, the way that Senator Yuko and Senator Burke worked really uh, worked together was, um, I think, you know, especially in in the times we're living in and and the campaign that we're seeing right now was uh was really refreshing which is you know why you know people like tom and i can sit next to each other and talk <laughs> about the same thing and agree on some things and not claw each other's eyes out <laughs> um so you know it's it, it was a really refreshing experience to see something um uh, passed especially you know so early in my career to be able to see like um, a, a piece of a really big meaningful piece of legislation that was going to mean a lot to a lot of people again not perfect um, but, you know there will be changes I'm sure um, in the near future um, but to see that big first step hurdle yeah that big first uh, step in the right direction um, that big first hurdle cleared um, with a bipartisan effort um, and also bipartisan disdain for it um, you know was was really Really cool to see and a uh, really refreshing experience. And again, thank everybody for coming out and, and Case Western and Legal Women Voters and Jackie Borchard and Cleveland.com and um, everybody for uh, coming out tonight. And don't token drive. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, thank you for our panelists. I'm so glad that you were be, could be here. And thank you to everybody who came for and stood in the back because we didn't have enough chairs. Thank you. Uh, thanks to everyone who is watching on the live stream. I know there are quite a few people doing that. Uh, the Siegel Lifelong Learning Program at Case Western, uh, the League of Women Voters of Greater Cleveland, Plain Dealer, Cleveland.com, Lakewood Public Library, uh, and the Cuyahoga County Public Library System. Thank you, and uh, have a safe trip home. Thanks. <laughs>